I'm going to sing a couple of songs, as I threatened to. The first is going to be from an oratorio I wrote years ago after a visit to the Holy Land. And I felt such inspiration there that the, it all came out in music uh, after I returned to Italy in Sorrento. This, is the, uh, the, this piece is written for cello and voice for Christ as he walked uh, toward his crucifixion. Next song is, uh, it's written, I wrote it after visiting a cloister in Italy. There's an interesting story here, because it was a cloister at one time, but now it's no longer a monastery, and is a place that tourists visit. And so I found it very interesting, and this is what I have learned in writing music, that if I know very clearly what I want, then offer it up to the superconsciousness and to God, the melody comes, it's exactly right. Now in this one, the melody that came was first of all Gregorian, because this was a, a, a monastic place, a monastery, a monastic setting. But then, because there was an overlay of tourism there, I had to bring it out of the Gregorian mode. And you'll see that I do that and then, having come out of the Gregorian mode, and this is something I'd like to talk about later on, having come out of it, there was a natural tendency owing to our habit in modern music to suddenly throw it into emotion. But emotion, although it may go up in a scream, takes the energy down. And what I needed to do was take that energy and calm it, control it, rein it in, and then in that calmness, it would be much more intense. And at the end, you'll notice, if you know music, that I don't end, as usual, in a song on the tonic. Because to end it on the tonic would be to end it. But this is supposed to be a song to God, and therefore to infinity. And the song itself, therefore, instead of going down to the tonic, sort of drifts off into the infinite. So there's a lot of... Uh, um, but I didn't understand all of this at the time because I didn't write it mentally. I let it come. And then later I said, oh, so that's what you had in mind. <laughs> so let's uh, give me a note. Thy will, thy will. No, that's wrong. What am I talking about? <laughs> Long I've called you, my Lord, long I've called you. Many years I have... What is it? 
What? Look at this. You write these stupid <laughs> things. Then... <laughs> I mean, if the composer can't remember. <laughs> Long I've called you, my Lord. Long I've called you. Many years I have longed for your sight. Bathe the darkness with tears of devotion. Offered candles in prayer to your light. How much longer, friend, must I cry your name? I am yours, ever yours. Will you come? Long I've called you, my Lord, long I've called you. Many years I have longed for your sight. Bathe the darkness with tears of devotion, offered candles in prayer to your light. How much longer, friend, must I cry your name? I am And so you see the first two lines are Gregorian. Long I've called you, my Lord, long I've called you. Many years I have longed for your sight. Then it was that I, it broke out of that into a more modern and less, less monastic, typical monastic kind of sound. Bed the darkness with tears. No Gregorian melody would do that with tears of devotion, offered candles in prayer to your light. Now modernity comes in and demands that you sing, how much longer, friend? <laughs> oh, that would have killed it. <laughs> so I had to rein it in. And you see how much more power there is when there's feeling but not emotion. Instead of how much longer, friend, how much longer, friend, must I cry your name? I am yours, ever yours. Now what would classical style go? Back to the tonic. I am yours, ever yours, will you come? Kill it. <laughs> you have to say, I am yours, ever yours, will you come? So you see, music is a language, and it's a language which I have loved all my life and gradually, more and more through my life, tuned myself to. I didn't ever want to be a singer. I, I, uh, when I was young, lots of people wanted me to become one, and uh, yet I felt, no, this is not my calling. I have to, I have to sing what I really mean. And most classical songs, I studied voice, but most classical songs are just about any, uh, like any country and western as far as meaning goes. I loved her, she left me, she done me wrong. <laughs> I mean, you know what happens if you play a country and western song backwards? You get back your car, your wife, your <laughs> pickup truck. <laughs> And so there's this, O cessate di piagarmi, o lasciate mi morir, which sounds pretty good in Italian, but all it really means is stop bugging me and <laughs> let me die. <laughs> and so whereas 
much classical music is really beautiful. I remember visiting Bergen in Norway a few years ago. I visited the home of uh, Edvard Grieg, and I was deeply moved just to be there. There was a vibration. There was, uh, his music is beautiful. It's not the greatest, but it just moved me to tears. There is something in music. And people have asked me sometimes, well, why have you started centers here? Why have you started here? Somebody asked me that question today. Well, how come you came to Portland? What made you decide to move or to build an Ananda center in Portland? And I have to apologize. I haven't been here since the last century. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, what brought me here was perhaps more than anything else, two things, devotion and music. There was a great fondness for music here. And every part of the world seems to have a particular vibration. It's so interesting to one like myself who has spent his life traveling. I started traveling when I was six months old and I haven't stopped. And what I like most about traveling is not the ruins, the history, the uh, buildings, the architecture. Uh, I like most the vibrations. Every place has a particular vibration. And although people, certainly are people wherever you go, still there's an, uh, sort of an underlying bias in each place that uh, you feel differently. When I, I live in Italy, as m many of you know, <clears throat> I'll be back there within about three weeks. What I love there is the heart quality. And I, I have to say that I love that here too. But it's a very interesting fact to look back over a lifetime, really. It's a moderately long life. I'll be 75 next month. And that's not a spring chicken. I may have a little longer to go slogging through the mud. But nonetheless, um, I can look back over no, much more than any other 75-year-old in this room could look back over in one sense, that I was born in a medieval country. I've spent centuries in one lifetime. <laughs> really, we, uh, we, Romania, where I was born, of American parents, but uh, still, I grew up there. For 13 years, I lived there, and we spoke several languages there. But what a change from then. You know, they used to have, uh, the one time they tried to become modern, and they got this bright idea of going on daylight saving time, but they got it wrong and went on daylight losing time. <laughs> and I could only think, only Romania. <laughs> but it was a beautiful country, very simple, very primitive in a way. But how great a change from then up through all the modern times, jet airplanes were unheard of. Airplanes were almost unheard of. If a plane happened to go by, we'd all run outdoors and wave. It was a big thing. Television, non-existent. Radio, some big clunker that you'd turn and, oh, this is BBC, oh, BBC London, oh. <laughs> and uh, we, we, it was altogether different. Computers, well, of course, you know how recently those came out. Back in 1949, and I think it was Science, Popular Science, or Science Monthly, or something or other, some expert said that someday computers may be small enough to uh, actually weigh only one ton. <laughs> Hard to believe how things have changed. And I've been sort of watching these changes, experiencing them, somehow never been identified with any of them, and yet experiencing them through other people and so on. One change that I've noticed is a change toward thinking that you can, and this has been a Western delusion for centuries really, but it's getting stronger I think in some ways, the thought that you can understand everything with the mind only. You can't. You know, a very, very interesting discovery in modern times has been, medical science has proved, has discovered that there are as many nerve cells in the heart as there are in the brain. That the heart actually has intelligence. 
And there was a book I read that many of you may have heard of, or you could find it at New Renaissance, I'm sure, perhaps elsewhere, of a woman who had heart surgery. Not ordinary heart surgery, not like what I had a little while ago, which was just gave me a new valve. They gave her a new heart. And she found that her personality changed in extraordinary ways. With this new heart, the first thing she wanted was something she'd never wanted before, was chicken wings. <laughs> and she found thoughts coming into her mind that just that wasn't a part of her. And she was so curious and desirous of learning what was, this was all about that she made a great effort to find out who her donor had been. And they usually try to hide that from the patient, but she managed to find out. And he was a young man who had just the qualities that she felt continually sort of invading her normal personality. First thing she wanted was just something he'd loved, which was chicken wings and all sorts of other things. I can tell you as a composer, which I am also, that uh, you said over 300, it was actually 403 pieces I've written. <laughs> yeah, what does it matter? But the thing is, <laughs> after sternly correcting her, I said, well, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> Sort of like something I read about Einstein backing bashfully into the limelight. <laughs> anyway, the thing is that I have found in writing music that I don't, there are millions of people who know more about music than I do, but I write what I hear. And what I hear has to correspond to what I feel in the heart. And if there's anything I can tell people, it's please get more into your heart. Because your heart is not just emotion. Behind that emotion there is intuition. Intuition is calm feeling, emotion is ruffled feeling. That's the only difference. And without intuition you can't know. I remember when I was in college and studying philosophers and so on, I didn't like Plato. Great as he was, I didn't like this concept that you can just sort of talk it all out and you'll understand it. I, he'd get up to a certain level in his ratiocination and I'd start thinking, wait a minute, my heart doesn't, hasn't been asked. I don't necessarily agree. How do I know it's true? It can make a lot of sense. And I used to drive people crazy because people would give me a, an absolutely logical proposition explanation, I wouldn't agree. I wouldn't accept it. I couldn't refuse it. I couldn't reject it. But it didn't correspond to this. We need to listen more to this because all great works come from here, minimally from here. They come from intuition. You take science, which is a perfect example of a field of knowledge that uses reason. And yet, here's how reason works. You go from this point logically to that point logically to the next point. There comes a point, if you're really deep in this, that all of a sudden you understand. Now that sudden understanding does not come from logic. You've got to backtrack to explain how you arrived at that, and afterwards scientists are convinced that's how they got there. They didn't. Einstein understood his law of relativity in a flash. It took him 10 years to explain it in such a way that other mathematicians and scientists were able to understand what he was talking about. But teachers, for example, who try to ask you in school, now how did you arrive at that? If you say, I don't know, and the answer is right, don't let them put your poor nose to the grindstone and make you go through a process you did not go through. Because so many things in life, you can you can get into it, you have to be, have your feet on the ground, you have to follow a certain line of logic, yes. But all of a sudden, you understand. Now that understanding is your intuitive faculty. This is what I found in writing music, that when I ask the right question, when I'm very clear as to what I want, and as to the kind of melody that I want in order to say what I'm trying to say, then I don't even have to work for it. It's just there. You know, all, I don't know how many people have heard my album, 
um, well, all the bookstores call it Derek Bell's album, and it's perfectly true, he played it, but I wrote it. And <laughs> I wrote all of those melodies in one and a half days. How? Because I didn't sweat. So many composers sweat over their work. You don't have to. You ask. And when you know what you're asking, and when the asking is very clear, then it's there. Now I grant you it has to come also through calmness, through meditation, through concentration, yes. But you have all these faculties in yourself. And if you think that you've got to sweat blood to do things, it isn't true. The wonderful thing about learning spiritual teachings is not the teachings, not the philosophy, not the reasons and explanations. It's getting close to that intuitive feeling, which does involve the heart. There's no way around it. There's altogether too much in religion that gives people the impression that once they've defined a thing dogmatically well, then uh, they've understood it. You haven't understood it. But when you know it with your heart, it changes your life. This is what happened to me. I was wondering, I was living in Scarsdale, New York, wondering what the heck to do with my life. I knew I wanted God. I didn't know where to turn. I went to church. It wasn't giving me what I wanted. I read books. They weren't giving me what I wanted. I read autobiography of a yogi, and I said, that's it. I'd never heard of yoga. As far as I was concerned, it could have been a kind of yogurt. I didn't know. <laughs> I'd never heard words like guru or karma or words that are common currency today, but this was back in 19... 48, and people didn't know much about that sort of thing then. I didn't know anything. But I took the next bus from New York to Los Angeles. And the first words I addressed to Yogananda, the author of that book, were, I want to be your disciple. That was 53 years ago. I haven't had a moment's change of heart, because it was the heart that was convinced, not the mind. In fact, the poor old mind was absolutely just, <laughs> God, what are you doing to me? <laughs> I had so many doubts just spewing up like when the waves break on the shore. It just was altogether different, but my heart was convinced. And so I hung in there until I could understand reasonably also, and I saw how beautifully it made sense. But never for a moment did I doubt that this was what I had in mind. This was what my life was dedicated to. And this is why I'm here today. Because I want so deeply to share the teachings of you. Not the teachings of Paramahansa Yoga, no, no, not the teachings of the East. Things about you, things about me, things about life that are not even religious. They're spiritual, yes, but they aren't necessarily religious. When somebody recently or people were complaining that the Dalai Lama was being sponsored by the state and this was wrong, it was interfering with the, the religion and, and uh, government, well, all I can say is if a government really excludes spirituality, the government is dead. Life has to include spirituality. You can't not. But spirituality doesn't mean a church. Spirituality doesn't mean a dogma. It doesn't mean Christianity versus Hinduism or whateverism. But it does mean being able to look at a mountain and, well, a story comes to mind and it's a good one. There was this hunter who was shooting ducks. And he went out in his boat and he shot a duck. And the dog jumped out of the boat and ran across the water and took this duck and ran back. And he did it again, the dog just ran over, and so he just couldn't believe his eyes. He said, I've got to bring a witness. So the next day he went out there with a friend of his, and he shot a duck, and the, duck, the dog ran a, a, across and ran back, and this friend of his just, and he thought, am I crazy? So he did it again, and the dog ran out again and ran back, and this man said to his friend, but didn't you see what the dog just did? Yeah, the stupid animal can't swim. <laughs> so a lot of people will look at miracles and they'll say, oh, yeah. They'll look at mountains. That's just a bunch of mud. What are you talking about? A mountain can be so beautiful. 
Life can be so wonderful. People can be so wonderful. To see the beauties of this world, the wonder of this world, the wisdom of this world, the lessons of this world, the opportunities, and yet people tend to be couch potatoes. They look at life and what does it mean to them? But I long to help people to wake up to this truth of their own being, which is a spiritual truth, not a religious truth. When people talk of Christian humility, I think, well, for God's sake, aren't Buddhists humble too? Can't atheists be humble? Why do you have to monopolize truth? Truth is as free as the air. But that truth without something higher isn't truth. It's not worth living. When you look at life and don't see anything wonderful about it, there's something wrong with you. And what I want to do is help people to see that behind all the difficulties and the tests and so on of life, there's only opportunity. I went through a time, and in fact, this is a book I've just finished writing and just got it published. It's called A Place Called Ananda. And it's the story of Ananda, but it doesn't really tell about Ananda. It tells about the attitudes that were developed that made Ananda possible. So it actually ends, if you can believe it, in the year 1970. But by then, I've given the basis where people who are interested in these things can do it themselves. It shows the right attitudes. The, it tells lots of stories, yes, but all in the context of a deep and important teaching. And that teaching, again, is you. It's not something. And Yogananda didn't come to bring something where you sort of sit there and pull on your ear and say, wow, that's, that's deep. I don't understand a word. <laughs> no. It isn't something where you say the next day, now, what was it he said? Uh, no, it sinks in because it's you. And this book was that. I remember there was a, well, remember, how could I not remember? I was thrown out on my ear from the organization I was a part of. And with great imprecations and great uh, hatred. And I had to face the idea, face the thought, am I going to take their reality or mine? I personally am happy when I love, but I'm unhappy when I don't love. So shall I return hatred for hatred? Shall I return bitterness for mi mistreatment and injustice? I would suffer twice. I'm happy loving, therefore I choose to love no matter what they do. They can't make me not love them. I've been in a great embarrassment to them over the years. <laughs> Probably the best revenge I could get. <laughs> But the fact is, it's so wonderful to love and so painful not to love. Now, all of you have gone through experiences where people have disappointed you, where you felt betrayed, where you felt let down. And the first and most natural impulse is to react in uh, an excluding way in some way, either revenge or anger or hatred or bitterness or just closing in and saying, I'll never love again, like that song of Frank Sinatra, I'll never smile again, you know. Well, probably he was smiling by the next Tuesday, but nonetheless, it's... Uh, <laughs> the fact is that when we love people, we are happy. And not only that, but when we love people, we make them happy. I had a wonderful experience in Paris not Paris, Maine, Paris, France, <laughs> years ago. There was an orchestra that I wanted to hear. And uh, it happened to be my birthday, and I was eager to hear it, but I got there when they were just closing the door. And so I cried out in French, but it's my birthday. And he said, oh, well, welcome. So he let me in. But there was, there was no place for me in the audience, so they had to put me with about four or five, six other people behind the altar. So I got to be facing the whole audience of 700 people. Anyway, the music was so joyful, and it must have shown in my face in some way, because afterwards, um, I was on the metro, the subway, and some old woman came to me, and she said, uh, do you remember me? I, I said, no, I, I'm sorry, I don't. Well, I was in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> 
700 people and I was supposed to remember her. <laughs> but what happened and what made it so sweet was that she had felt a personal connection. So to her it was very real and she sat down and was telling me about problems she was having with her family and all sorts of things that you'd never tell a stranger. But you know, when you are full of divine light and joy and love, people feel it, even complete strangers. Because the best thing you can do for other people is to help them to feel that in themselves. We've really been born for only one reason, but most of us don't know it. That question was asked of some of the great sages in ancient India who answered when they, when they asked, why were we born? Why was this universe made? And the answer was, God wanted to enjoy himself through many. Now you look at people in Auschwitz, joy, not really. You look at people suffering, bankrupt, betrayed, abandoned, dying of some disease, joy, how can you talk about it? And yet, yes, you can. You can because the soul is untouched by anything. You know, there was a very interesting experience that uh, one of my fellow disciples had. She was with Yogananda at a performance. And later Yogananda said, I saw you looking at that little girl about three years old. And uh, this disciple said, yes, I was fascinated by her. She just, I couldn't take my eyes off her. And he said, you know, in her last life she was in a concentration camp in Germany and died there. And because of her experiences there, she was born, has been born in this life a saint. How many times that's happened? I talked to a woman just two days ago who is a very spiritual and visionary person. And she had a vision in which she saw herself and her husband and very emaciated and she saw a sign Auschwitz. But I told her this story. There's no pain that doesn't have its compensating part if you can withdraw enough from it and not be so caught in the moment that that becomes your reality. Remember, everything changes. We all have to go through many things, but why does God allow that? Why does God allow that suffering? Why does God allow that pain? Well, let's put it down to a very simple illustration. A stove, when it's hot, you put your hand on it, it burns. Now is the stove uh, being hateful? Is God unkind for making the stove hot? Not at all. That heat is a means of helping you to know that you shouldn't touch something hot. And you suffer once, yes, but then you know don't touch hot stoves. Every lesson in life, although far more complex than that, always boils down to that simple thing. When you feel pain, it's something that you should not have done. It's gone against the law. Jean-Paul Sartre, and I'm sure some of you have read him, said that we, man is radically free. He can do anything he wants to. Well, apart from the fact that his philosophy was totally dishonest, all he said was, man is radically free, therefore man is radically free. That's essentially his philosophy. Sure, decked up in all sorts of frills, but it becomes that. He gives you a premise that he doesn't defend, doesn't explain, cons you into believing it and saying, therefore, and the result is the same thing as he declared in the first place. No, man has certain things that he needs to learn. And when, uh, if you say man is radically free, can you eat nails? If you can't eat nails and get away with it, then you are not radically free. <laughs> there are laws in nature and we have to learn what those laws are. Physical laws don't eat nails. So one lifetime and probably a death, the next time perhaps you won't eat nails. <laughs> But there are psychological laws, too, that when you're unkind to other people, you're unkind to yourself. And you know why people laugh when they tell, uh, when they say unnice things about other people? Because they're trying to sort of laugh, the, laugh it off, say, oh, I really wasn't being mean. Isn't he stupid? Isn't he ugly? <laughs> Is that all that funny? I don't think it's funny. People laugh when they say things that are wrong because they're trying to hide something that they know is wrong. 
They're trying to salve their conscience. But there's something inside us that always knows that when I'm unkind to other people, I may try to bluff it through, but there's something inside that, oh, that's wrong. Why? Really, it's a very simple principle. There is a basic desire in the part of every one of us, because we're children of the same infinite consciousness, a desire to expand. Therefore, we're happy when we have a greater feeling of experience, knowledge, whatever, and a desire not to contract. And anything that contracts you, either your heart or your mind, is going to cause a certain uneasiness, disease. You want to share with others because you want to expand your sympathies, you want to expand your, your uh, uh, love for people, you want to expand your understanding. And it's a simple fact that when you do do something nice, I won't say for a change, I'll just say when you <laughs> do do something nice, suddenly you feel, oh, that feels good, doesn't it? And when you do something that's unkind, it doesn't feel right. This is God's way of slowly and how achingly slowly, but nonetheless always bringing us finally to that point where he can enjoy himself through all. His desire is to joy, enjoy himself through all, but we have to reach that point where we can bring and feel his joy flowing through us. And the more we can eliminate the sense of I and mine, the more we can expand and include other people in our happiness, include them in our sympathies, include them in our love, the better it is because the closer we will come to feeling that he is doing everything through us. Now there are many pitfalls on the way. The thought that I can only do it if I belong to this, the thought that I can only do it if I, uh, if I know this or have this. Get away from that thought and say, it's yours, God. I have seen it in writing music. It's a wonderful example. In this book, A Place Called Ananda, I wrote about how I came to compose music. I was up in Yosemite. Well, from here it's down in Yosemite. And I was enjoying myself very much. The last day before I was to leave, I saw a couple of young men sitting on a uh, railing of a bridge playing with a guitar. And I was in a mood to sing, so I said, well, may I sing with you? And they said, yes. So I suddenly realized I didn't know anything except classical songs and Indian chants and Yogananda's chants, and I thought, well, none of these are going to go over. <laughs> and so I thought, what, what is there? And I, I've been working on the railroad, didn't know. And it didn't. <laughs> so then I thought suddenly, swing low, sweet chariot. And I sang that, and they said, oh, would you come to a party we're having tonight? You could sing for us. So I went there. And what did I sing? I've been, I mean, uh, swing low, sweet chariot. I couldn't think of anything else. But uh, the next day I was driving home and it occurred to me, what a wonderful way to share with people. And then it occurred again, but what could I sing? I want to sing something that I mean. I know I was doing a recording one time in a studio in San Francisco and uh, the, some man had come to the recording engineer and shown him a song and the recording engineer said, oh, I know just the person to record it and he mentioned me. And so he uh, wanted me to uh, be there when this man came and uh, hear the song. Well, uh, I said, listen, it's a nice song. I've nothing against it, but it doesn't say what I want to say. It doesn't correspond to my beliefs and I wouldn't want to sing it because it's, it's not against what I believe, but I, I just don't feel to. So he went home and tried to write a song that was in keeping with my beliefs. San Francisco, city of Vishnu. <laughs> no, my beliefs are not Vishnu and Shiva. My beliefs are something that uplifts the soul. Call it God, call it anything you like. But that which uplifts the soul in this music wasn't uplifting. But uh, that's what I wanted to do. And as I was driving along, suddenly this song came to me. And it was so nice, I was really inspired by this. And I stopped at a milkshake stand and wrote it down on a piece of paper. And uh, my brother had left his uh, guitar, Martin guitar, at my parents' home. So I 
uh, took up that and went and bought a, a book on learning how to play the guitar, and I managed to struggle through a few chords, and believe it or not, within a month, somebody asked if I wouldn't give a concert. Well, it was the craziest thing I could possibly imagine. You don't learn a guitar in a month. And uh, yet, I thought, well, at least it'll force me to practice. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> and so there I was. Well, the worst of it was, first of all, there were 200 people. Secondly, they wanted to create atmosphere. Thirdly, their way of creating atmosphere was to turn off all the lights and have one candle burning on the mantelpiece behind me. Well, if there was one thing I needed to see, it was those cords. <laughs> anyway, it went well, and everybody liked it. I told stories, and I, I sang songs with or without decent chords. And somebody later afterwards said to me, I'm at San Francisco State, I'm majoring in music, and you know, there's some uh, interesting chords you had there. <laughs> I said, yeah, thank you. I'm <laughs> He walked off muttering, hmm, yes, uh, <laughs> unusual. <laughs> but nonetheless, this launched my career as a composer. And I found over a period of time that music says it too, that the language is not just words, the language is not just ideas, music, feelings, love. You can say more with just a thought to somebody than you can with a whole sermon. And so, what I urge you to do is in whatever you do, you can put heart into it. Yes, you can. Enthusiasm, enjoyment, happiness. It doesn't have to be love, no. It can be just the sheer exuberance of being alive. But that's what we have to bring to the world, and that's what I felt here in Portland. It's become, over these years, a little more mental, I would say too mental, but there's also that love for music, that love for heart, that love for nature, which is heart also. Please don't let that die out. Bring it back. Put some life into it. The more you practice yoga, remember, yoga is a total misnomer if you think that it's just a matter of bending your body into pretzel shapes. Yoga, above all, the definition of yoga given in the classical treatise in India on yoga by Patanjali, the standard text on yoga. Yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the neutralization of the waves of chitta or feeling. If you can reach the point where feeling doesn't mean getting all upset about something and all emotional, if you can get your feelings calm, then you will find that all of a sudden you have an understanding that your mind won't give you. The mind can explain things in a hundred ways and make it seem very reasonable. But in fact, if the heart agrees, that's when you can be sure. It has to feel right. Live more in your heart. Live more, in not in your emotions, but in your feeling of things, so that when you see that beautiful mountain, don't say, yep, that's a mountain, all right. No. <laughs> Feel it. Music, I think, is perhaps the most important art, because more than any other art, in my opinion at least, it touches the heart. The more you can listen to music, this is what they, a book I read uh, recently talked about, the Chinese emperors, that they would tour the provinces, and they didn't ask to see the books or talk to the officials and all that. What they asked was to listen to the music. If the music was wrong, they knew something else would be wrong in the city government. If the music was right, everything was right. And if it was wrong, they knew that they didn't have to correct this. They had to correct the music. Now, there's a lot of truth in that. It may be a myth, it may not be an actual fact, doesn't matter. There are many truths that are not necessarily factual, but they, they illustrate principles that are eternal. When your music is right, your heart is right. That's what is so sad about today's music. It is so jagged, so frenetic. 
I, I look back over the, I always read human, people's consciousness through music. And as I look back through the history of popular music, because that says it more, so from say, let's say the 18th century with the minuet, which was graceful but very stylized, up through the waltz. You know, people used to think the waltz was really degenerate. <laughs> Women touching men, <gasps> unthinkable. In public, <gasps> you know. So there was a lot of thought that this was debased music. Well, they hadn't seen nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> and you came up into the, into the uh, 20th century, and people's arms, legs sort of flying everywhere, completely out of control. Then you got into the big band, ba -bam, ba -bam, so much ego. Everything in music has a message, it says something. And when you listen to the music of rock and roll and heavy metal and all these things, you're really exposing yourself to a rate of, a state of consciousness, not just music. It is not just a question of taste. It's a question of truth. And does your truth really resonate with restlessness and anguish and anger and violence? I don't believe it does because you're a child of God as much as I am. God wants to express himself and enjoy himself through all. God wants you to come to him. And that means you need to listen to music that soothes your consciousness, that uplifts your consciousness. You need meditation. You may say, well, I can just see myself sitting there cross-eyed, doing nothing, thinking nothing. That's not what it's all about. When you lift your consciousness, there's so much sweetness. It, it just changes you. That's what life's all about. That's what you were born for. You know it. And it's there. It can be experienced. It's your real self. You don't have to think always, oh, I've got to be practical. No. Learn to love. Learn to rejoice. And learn to think of God. I was lecturing in Australia years ago, and a man came up to me afterwards, and he said, well, I'm an atheist. <laughs> what can you tell me about God that would have any meaning for me? <clears throat> And I, I restrained myself. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't say, well, why don't you? <laughs> I said, why don't you just think of God as the greatest, the highest potential you can, ma you can imagine for yourself? And he was totally taken aback. And he thought, well, I can live with that. <laughs> and you can. It's you. There's no God if he isn't in you. And all you can ever know of God is in you. You can't find him just by going to a church or a pilgrimage place. It's first of all here. And you are as divine as any saint who ever lived. You have that potential. Why sell yourself short? Why keep your eyes on the ground when there's so much around you? Live more in God. I don't say join this church. I don't say join that church. I don't say my books do it, Yogananda's books do it, nothing will do it. You have to do it for yourself. But the more you can live with a sense of really serious, joyful gratitude for life, the more life will mean to you and more you will find that the words of Jesus were true. When he said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And he said, let the dead bury their dead. Most people are dead because they have no joy, no enthusiasm. They just they go through life from cradle to grave and then it's over. Trouble is, it's not over. Trouble is you go on and you'll keep going on until finally you learn your lesson. And that lesson is to really, to the roots of your being, know that I belong to him. I belong, why him? Why not her? Why her? Why not it? These are all just symbols. But you belong to an infinite consciousness of which you are a vital part. And you can be consciously rejoicing with that infinite love and joy. Every moment of your being. I lived with a saint who expressed that joy. I remember one time sitting with him. He was talking about holes that had to be dug, uh, work filled in in the, 
in the uh, um, driveway of Mount Washington, potholes, very mundane work, very mundane conversation. I wasn't involved, so I could close my eyes. I felt so much joy in his presence that it didn't matter what he was talking about, that's who he was. That's what I want to convey. Because if I have anything to offer, it's what I know from him, what I've received from him. Yes, I'm not going to say it's totally unknown to me, but he was such an example. And other great saints, they are the ones to look for, to look to. You can be that. You can be another St. Francis. You can be another Christ. All of that is your, not just your potential, your destiny. God bless you.